So everyone at this facility is um, seeking asylum. All of the women and children at this facility are seeking asylum. Um, and they are all just having crossed over the border um, and, and seeking asylum. The way that the law is written, they have to pass this initial credible fear interview before they can then stay in the country, uh, go to court, appear before a judge, and go through that whole process. The, the circumstances in which some of these people have arrived here are almost unconscionable. I've heard stories about children uh, with their mothers hiding in luggage compartments of buses that aren't properly ventilated, children nearly dying from dehydration, um, the most ghastly imaginable circumstances. And that speaks volumes about the kind of danger and peril that they face in their home countries, that they would be willing to risk their, risk their lives under such um, dreadful circumstances to, to try to make their way to this country. It's, it's even difficult to, to say the medical issues that you know, I saw coming into to the trailer from, from rapes and domestic violence that they had to carry with them as they made the journey here. In this facility, it is a fam it's one of three family detention facilities in the country. It's by far the largest. Um, and it is only women and children. The vast majority of the clients here are from Central America. They're from Honduras. They're from El Salvador and they're from Nicaragua. Um, there are only the smallest handful from Mexico. Uh, but most everybody is from Central America and most of, the, and all, um, I, can, I can hardly, I don't even think I can think of a client I've spoken to this week who hadn't been um, subjected to some form of threats of murder, of violence, of rape, of other kinds of, of extreme uh, personal safety threats who had fled um, uh, to avoid uh, being killed or their children being killed. You know, my thick skin just wasn't thick enough. Um, knowing that if our country turns them away, um, they very well will be brutalized and or killed. Um, that was really hard. It was really hard. So it, they walk in and they tell a story without even speaking. Um, and when we ask about physical violence especially, you see, you see scars on them. You see scars. Well, every single client that I talked to here was a woman and a mother. And my clients here were from Central America. And every single one of them had been threatened, abused. Um. You do hear on, on the news and you hear uh, politicians and different people say that you know so many of these women are lying and they're just tr making things up to, to get into the country. That's what you hear. So I, I didn't know what the experience would be like being here, but I, I did not have that experience whatsoever. And I had asylum officers in the interviews who I could tell that they also believed them and they would they would hear their stories and it's really difficult to hear their stories. They were desperate and amazingly strong and inspiring. A lot of the, we have to remember, a lot of the women and children are making the journey right after the final straw happened in their lives, which could be severe violence and threats and trauma. So they're making the journey, carrying that with them. Some of them came in through the port of entry, the, the major port of entries all across the southwest border. Um, and some of them came because they crossed the border, um, not at a port of entry, and then were picked up by immigration right as they were crossing over, or right, right near the border. It's a combination of bus, walking, uh, a lot of walking, um, uh, hitchhiking, that's common, and boat across the river or just uh, walking across the river. So Seeking asylum is not something that you can do from abroad. You have to be in the United States to seek asylum, which is why you can either cross the border 
or present yourself at a port of entry, but um, it, it is not a process that's available to them from Honduras or Guatemala or wherever they may live. And so they are coming to the U.S. and then applying for asylum from there. Under the uh, U.S. immigration law, there is a specific set of criteria that's established for uh, people who seek asylum or refugees, uh, and they're called refugees when they're outside the United States and asylees when they're uh, asylum seekers when they're inside the United States already. Uh, and essentially, the asylum law has a specific set of criteria uh, on which you qualify for asylum. Uh, and the criteria is fundamentally this, although, and, and I'm being a little imprecise, a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of a particular kind of category where you can't relocate safely within your own country and the local authorities, meaning the, the country authorities, will not or cannot control those reasons. And those five reasons are race, religion, national origin, political opinion, or being a member of a particular social group. You know, the uh, United States has signed conventions and treaties on human rights that require it to accept asylees that you know meet certain criteria and so it, it would actually be against the law for the United States to just deny people that are trying to come in the right to seek asylum if that's what they're trying to do. The United States uh, has ratified a, a number of different multilateral treaties um, including the Convention Against Torture and others um, and a, a treaty which has been ratified by the United States has the same effect as a federal statute would. And uh, under these treaties, the United States is obligated under some circumstances uh, to allow somebody uh, asylum in the United States. Now obviously, uh, there is an evidentiary burden that has to be met. Uh, there's a due process uh, that has to be afforded to these folks um, in pursuing uh, what we would call uh, this this relief, uh, you might call it, um, and, and so that that essentially is the foundation upon which U.S. asylum law is based. Uh, so, for example, uh, if somebody is from an indigenous peoples and there's an attempt to uh, to to commit genocide of indigenous peoples, that could be a basis for seeking asylum in the United States. Asylum is permission um, from the United States uh, to live here uh, as a safe haven. And essentially, the way that the model works is the clients, after they get brought to Dili, which usually happens within about three days of when they cross the border, they get held in a border patrol facility and then brought here. And they come to an intake. Uh, we call them charlas, which charla in Spanish is just like a, it's basically like a, a you know, lecture or work, just a group chat kind of thing. Um, they, so somebody will, um, a, a volunteer will lead that. Um, and the, they have an intake charla. And at the intake charla, they fill out all their basic biographical information paperwork. They agree that they want to be represented by the Dili Pro Bono Project. Um, and then once we have all that information, they actually send the data entry, the data um, to volunteer, remote volunteers who work to do data entry. Um, and then we, the, the client then comes back when they get their, um, when they get their interview notice date. We then set them up for a time to come back and do what we call a CFI prep charla. And at that one, someone explains what the CFI interview is, and then you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with an attorney um, in a private room where you can talk about your story and explain you know, why you're seeking asylum, and then the attorney will help you prep your case. And in So the, the biggest thing that I am doing um, has been um, getting information from the women to make sure that they're in the best position possible to be prepared for their interview with the immigration officer, to make sure that they can very well articulate what it is that they are afraid of. Flexible and being able to um, you know, quickly meet someone, establish a rapport, and you know, be able to handle that sort of delicate balance of trying to ask them as many questions as you can to get their full story out so that you can adequately prep them for their interview at the same time as not wanting to 
re-traumatize them because of all the many things they've gone through. So I think that's one thing that's really important. Yeah, and I was I was interviewing um, the women um, individually, and we um, I would just find out from them what they were afraid of, um, why they why they left their country, what they're afraid of. Um, to describe to me what has happened to them to cause them to be afraid to be in their home country. Um, went over with them what would happen if they were to return, um, if they, what happened if they tried to contact the police, what did the police do or the government do in their home country. Um, and then, you know, um, basically making sure that that, that that actually qualifies under our laws for asylum. Most of the work that I did involved attending these credible fear interviews, making sure that the um, officers were asking all of the questions that I felt were necessary in order for us to meet our burden, um, following up with some questions of my own, and then giving the officer at the end of the interview a summation of uh, the legal bases for a positive credi credible fear determination. There were days though this week that there were so many of us volunteers and so many women to talk to that I had to sit at a table in that main room and just do our best to go over the information in front of multiple people all waiting because there were just so many people and helping these women, right? When you walk into the trailer every morning, the first thing you see are a flurry of attorneys running around um, trying to organize themselves, trying to organize uh, um, the facts and, uh, that these women give them in a manner that will give them a positive um, result and will allow them, will grant them asylum status. Um, so while the attorneys themselves are, um, you know, are sort of engaging in this organized chaos. There's something that is so powerful about um, being able to be part of a team that has one goal, and it's that of validating the existence of these women and, and, and their children and their journeys. Well, well it's, it begins Sunday evening with a meeting where they brief us and everything. Uh, and there are conference calls even before that to, to help us to get prepared. And then come Monday, uh, we get in there and uh, we hit the ground running and, and uh, start meeting with these folks, preparing them for their interviews, uh, attending their interviews with them. There is also written work that has to be done during the different steps of, of this process. Um, and it's just uh, pedal to the metal all week. And we, we, we're kind of like on triage, on triage duty here, right? Because we're receiving them at their worst, at, after their absolute worst. And you know they've reached their breaking points and have to leave their countries and we, we are the first people that receive them. The two big issues are, are issues with domestic violence and gang violence. But these aren't neatly and conveniently uh, categorized as just that. I know that our attorney general would like to oversimplify it in that way, but it has become so systematized in these countries um, that essentially the gangs are the government. These are desperate, dire circumstances these folks are facing. The way that these mothers speak about their, about their home countries of Honduras, Guatemala, um, and Nicaragua in Central America has just been, they didn't want to leave. Why would you want to leave the home, the country that you that you've known your entire life, right? Capacity is there, so a lawyer who wants to volunteer who's not fluent in Spanish should also bring with them someone they know or you know find somehow find someone who could be their interpreter because it's not that helpful if we don't have enough interpreters. Yes. According to the Hispanic Bar Association only four percent of attorneys identify as Hispanic in the entirety of the United States. Uh, not just at this stage but assuming there's a positive credible fear finding then the case is going to go on to an immigration judge and that is the burden that you have to meet in immigration court in order to receive a grant of asylum. It's a long process, but the getting asylum, once you pass your credible fear interview and you go before an immigration judge in immigration court, you have to be able to show that you suffered persecution um, in your home country and that you have a well-founded fear of future persecution on the basis of 
what we call the protected, one of the five protected grounds. So those are race, uh, religion, national origin, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. And that last one um, is kind of a catch-all because every country that these folks are coming from is different and people get persecuted for different reasons in different countries. Um, they have to show that there is a significant possibility that they will face persecution if they return to their home country. Now, we have to look at the word persecution, however. Persecution requires a fairly significant amount of harm. Um, being called names or maybe being um, physically assaulted in a way where you don't sustain serious injury or anything like that generally is not enough to constitute persecution. But the Attorney General, because technically the Attorney General oversees that agency, also has the authority, if he doesn't like the way a case came out, he can actually refer it back to himself overrule the decision and issue his own opinion that no one has to sign off on but him. And so that is what Jeff Sessions did in this case a few weeks ago that's called Matter of AB. And what that case basically did was it made it a lot harder. It overruled an important precedential case that allowed domestic violence victims to gain asylum in certain instances um, if they could meet certain criteria. And essentially he said he overruled that and then he said in matter of AB that it will be very difficult for domestic violence victims or victims of gang violence to obtain asylum. Um, and you know obviously for immigrants and immigration advocates this decision is devastating. We haven't yet seen exactly how it's going to play out. Um, but I do know having you know met with many of the women this week that are in Dili um, that many of them are fleeing just horrific domestic violence. And the news that we've seen in the past few months has been astounding and heartbreaking. And I reached a breaking point uh, about a month ago, a little more than a month ago, when we were learning the stories and experiences of the children who were separated from their parents. And I needed to see it for myself while trying to help in any way possible. And so that's why I came to Dilly. I found the CARA Pro Bono Project. One of my friends suggested it and I emailed them and signed up to come for a week. I was aware um, that, that this was an opportunity to go down and volunteer for a week. Several of my friends and coworkers had gone, um, and so I was really interested in coming. I represent immigrants um, in Ohio, and many of them you know, originally crossed the border seeking asylum and were placed in um, detention centers like Dilly um, and others. And so I just felt like it was really important for me as an attorney um, to get a chance to see what this facility was like, see what, the, what the, these women and children are going through, and to try to help out in any way I can with the humanitarian crisis that we have going on right now. Uh, I've also been uh, a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association since uh, 2005. I'm active in my Ohio chapter, and so uh, as she does every several months, uh, our chapter president, Amy Bittner, uh, reached out to our uh, Ohio colleagues and asked if anyone was interested in spending a week uh, volunteering here in Dilly, Texas at the South Texas Family Residential Center uh, to help uh, some of these asylum seekers uh, with uh, preparing for their credible fair interviews. Well, you know, I have um, a special place in my heart for immigrants and um, even in my job, I, I speak Spanish. I'm here to serve at the end of the day. Um, and those, and any time that I'm able to serve these mothers and children in this particular situation is, is such a radical act of compassion that they need now more than ever. Um, so I'm here today um, as a translator, as an interpreter um, for um, a friend of mine who um, who practices civil rights law in St. Louis and I can't tell you what an incredible opportunity it's been. Uh, I came to Dilly because 
I can't think of anything more important than making sure that everyone has an opportunity to, for a fair opportunity to be heard. And we have lots of systems in place in the United States for people to uh, get legal advice, but uh, this population of people is in a very unique and special situation where they're entitled to legal advice but really literally physically have no access. And you, there are so many people who need, who need an opportunity to get some advice before, they, they're here, before their hearing happens, and this is a way to help them get that advice. What brings me to Dilly is a little bit of uh, just like a personal connection to the immigrant experience. I was born in Lima, Peru, um, and um, there was a lot of political instability in my home country, um, and they began to target uh, my family. My mother and I were attacked and separated from each other, um, and then given back, I was given back to my mother right then and there, um, after she was, uh, she was beaten. Uh, I was given back to my mother, and the individuals that were responsible for this contacted my father later that night and told him that that was just the beginning. But I'm here to to be a compassionate force for these mothers and children. But the Dilly Pro Bono Project um, is an organization that was started by several um, national immigrant rights organizations um, and the idea was when this facility was opened in 2014 by the Obama administration which started um, detaining families here um, that none of these women when they were crossing the border seeking asylum would have access or very few would have access to uh, legal services and so this organization was formed to be able to be a way to provide a legal services for women particularly um, in, in doing their credible fears inter interviews. Because if they pass the credible fear interview, they get, then get released, they move elsewhere in the country, and they're able to go to immigration court and uh, litigate their claim in court. So if you don't pass the credible fear interview, then you would get immediately deported. And so this was a critical um, void where when there were no lawyers, many women were unprepared with what to expect in their interview. They didn't know how to emphasize which parts of their story were important. They didn't know how to answer, you know, bring up previous harms that they had suffered. Sometimes they would only know to talk about the sort of straw that broke the camel's back and encourage them to come to the U.S. for the final time. Uh, you know, the, the thing that finally made them come to the U.S. And so we sort of help them think back, go through their entire stories, and prepare them for the ways that um, they might be able to, to best state their claims for the asylum officers. This is a, this is a pro bono project uh, that's a collaboration of multiple sponsors. And uh, so there's, it's essentially a, a sponsored pro bono law firm. Um, and the Dilly uh, pro bono project has uh, half a dozen staff members. There's an attorney, a paralegal, there's a volunteer coordinator. Um, well, each one of the collaborative partners um, spreads the word around to people who might be willing to be of service. Um, and so people will identify a week in which they can come. And there may be different reasons why they're available that week. Um, maybe they already have travel planned in the area, or maybe, they, or maybe they'll gather together a group of people and decide to come together. And the people that come are, uh, not just attorneys. So you have people that come that are attorneys. You have people that come who are uh, who are established paralegals. You have people who come who are are Spanish speakers who who um, are coming for purposes of just being interpreters and and other support. Uh, and you even have people whose backgrounds are in other kinds of uh, fields like psychology or social work or something like that. But we all come together for the purpose of creating this mini this law firm uh, for <laughs> that exists for a week um, to to provide the services to the client so people r really come from everywhere and so Kara has staff here and I must say they are absolutely remarkable staff their energy their enthusiasm uh, their hard work and intelligence uh, all have been enormously uh, inspiring to, to see and experience this week and it's been an honor working with them um, but uh, 
Um, what we do, um, generally the care of volunteers come down for a week. Um, and it's not just attorneys either. Bear in mind we have psychologists here, social workers here, we have law students here, translators, interpre interpreters. We have all kinds of different professionals uh, working together uh, as part of the uh, uh, care of volunteer team. Well, we had a huge number of volunteers this week. We, we, had, we had like 30 volunteers this week, which, which is a very big number. And I will tell you that's three times as many as we had last year. Um, the staff on the ground here that works full time is really great at keeping everything organized and the work flowing and just giving the volunteers stuff to do so that we can really spend as much time one-on-one -on -one with the clients. It is a rolling pro bono process where they have a new batch of attorneys and non-attorneys come and help uh, each week and they have a online system called Law Lab where all the case files and the case notes and what work has been done on each case is stored and so when attorneys uh, and volunteers come each week they just keep the case is going. Because the work, the, the permanent staff organize the work so well and they have a very good system of intake, preparation for the client, release information, all of that, uh, because those systems are really well organized, I think they do a pretty, it's pretty easy to then plug people in and have them do work. We also, you know, keep careful detailed notes so that the next week's volunteers, if there's a case that kind of carries over from week to week, they'll have that information. Um, so I do think that it works really well, and it is a pretty innovative model. Um, Several of my colleagues um, who came down here this week had no experience of any kind as in, in the field of immigration. Um, one fellow is a, a Title VII uh, employment discrimination attorney. Uh, another uh, wonderful uh, colleague out of Columbus is a public defender. She's worked in the public defender office for many years, but she speaks very good Spanish. Um, you don't have to have an immigration background to be helpful here. I'm not an immigration attorney in St. Louis. I have had no experience with that. So I what they do is they, they send out information um, over email. They do they, they do, do a phone conference. They send a, a video, training materials, and then everybody who is coming to volunteer comes for a in-person training on a Sunday evening, the Sunday evening before the week. And that's when it's, it's a final, hey, this is what's going on. Here's what you can expect. Um, here's what we know right now. And then the week is Monday through Friday. And um, I'd say most nights this week, I was there till when they kick us out at eight o'clock. So we fly in on Sunday, and on Sunday night we go to a pretty detailed training. Some of it is sort of reminders of basic asylum law. Many of us don't do asylum in our regular practice. Some of us are um, immigration lawyers of another type, and we don't typically do these cases. Some of us are other kinds of lawyers that don't do immigration, and all of those folks are, are welcome. Um, so we do plenty of sort of training that first night on how you know what the basic kinds of cases that we're going to see and how to ask the right questions. Um, they do a training before we get here on how to use the database system as well. And then Monday morning at 7 a.m. we start we go over to the facility um, and start meeting with clients. And when I was reading the description of the work on the CARA pro bono page uh, about the Dilly project, it seemed it wasn't intimidating to me. I, I felt like I had the skills to jump in. We were going to really be prepping women for their asylum interviews. You can do it. <laughs> I can do it. You can do it. Um, there is always something that can be done to help here. Yeah. You do not have to have immigration law experience at all. The legal visitation trailer is just crawling with children. Um, I mean, there are children everywhere because the women have the children with them at all times. Now, the school-aged children are in school, but the other children under the age of five, five and under, are with their moms at all times. And so, oftentimes, you're having an, you're in an interview with someone, 
and um, you know, you're trying to find out every detail you can that would be helpful to her asylum claim, and that often means talking about really awful and violent things um, in front of you know, this small child who may not understand all of it, but probably understands some of it, depending on the age. And so that is, that is really challenging. So it's typically women with small children. Sometimes they have a teenager with them or something, but mostly the kids are 11, 10, or even really small kids. The kind of kids you, a mom wouldn't, wouldn't or couldn't leave behind. Um, and they, come, they, they travel with their moms and then they're detained all together as a family. There's a space for all the kids. That's the most favorite <laughs> uh, view, visual in the, in the place. I mean, if you ever want to smile, you just look over to where the kids are and they're just coloring and talking. And that was such a joy this week, was that table. Uh, and especially when it got to be, you know, 12 kids at the table at one time, all coloring and volunteers going over and coloring. That was amazing. I mean, every woman, pretty much every woman that I have met with has cried during the preparation session. It, and many of them, you know, just, it, it's, it's just, shocking to me that they've been able to, that they had the courage to come here and fight for a better life and try to escape the violence that they've been um, subject to in their countries because it does take a lot I mean you know it would be much easier to just completely shut down and stay there but they you know really had the courage to to flee and that that's pretty amazing to see the United States so it really really shows you a lot of perspective about um, the resilience that these women that these women have but you know I, I had one woman who clearly had to go through at least one if not two other countries to get to our border and um, had shown me newspaper articles and pictures of her family that had been tortured and killed she showed me her gunshot wounds and explain to me how she's just been fleeing um, over the last decade um, and finally made her way here and at the border before coming into our country was brutally raped in front of her, one of her children. Oh, I make sure that whenever um, I speak to a mother for the first time I, I make sure to tell her that one, I am here for her, that we are, he we are here for her and two that we want her to stay here with us because we know how much work she put to get herself and her child across the border. To see them do such a good job telling their story that you've heard for hours and hours and hours and to stand up for themselves and their children is that that is a great day because that's all we can do here is to help them prepare for those interviews or that's the that's the main thing we can do with them here is to help them prepare for the interviews so to see the interview go well is a is a great day well without a doubt we were every one of us was impacted by the women we talked to um, I'm sure none of us will forget their stories yeah I mean that's what I, I have said to every woman that I've met with I so admire your courage because I, I mean, I am a mother of small children and the, I can empathize with, although, it, you know, it's completely different than my life experience, but with how challenging it must be to take your child or children and, you know, come all this way through the desert, coming up all the way, most of them are from Central America, all the way through Mexico. It's an extremely dangerous journey. There's a lot of crime on the on the route um, from the Triangle countries through Mexico and up to the border. And then many of them, when they get to the border, you know, have to wait another several days to even get over. Um, the bridge is always backed up. And so, you know, just thinking that how much they sacrificed because they want to make sure that they and their children don't have to have be subjected to this life of violence. So I think it's, you know, amazingly courageous what all of these women have done. Because it is, it is really difficult to listen to story after story of being attacked and persecuted and and raped and and all kinds of other lawlessness, but, and this I, I think this we had 
three times as many volunteers here this year, but we had six times as much need. That is the facilities rule. We're not, we were told in orientation that that is not allowed. If we see a child crying, we're not allowed to pick them up and console them. We have to take them by the hand and bring them to their mother who is probably meeting with a lawyer crying herself and then she has to console her crying child. So the moments that you want to physically uh, lend a hand or you know, put your hand on a, a client's shoulder or hug them are emotional moments, whether they're emotional sad or emotional happy, like when a kid you know, does a drawing and he smiles and he lifts up, you want to high five him. Uh, or if the woman gets a positive decision, you want to hug and embrace. And then if, if the woman is telling the worst tragedies of her life, you want to hold her hand. And, and um, those feelings were there this week, and it was very apparent. The rules against physical contact were very much felt for me in those moments. And if they identify that they're afraid, then they're supposed to have what's called a credible fear interview, uh, or a CFI as it in inevitably gets called. And the CFI is an asylum officer who's somebody whose job is full time to sit and listen to the stories and determine whether somebody has met um, a sort of a minimum threshold of of qualification and the asylum officer doesn't decide that they're qualified for asylum. The asylum officer determines whether they, if they can prove their case, that they, that they would be qualified for asylum. It's sort of a, an initial, what's your, an initial assessment, if you will. And so it's not, nobody who's fled from, from you know, having her house burned down behind her is going to have all her papers in order and all that sort of stuff. It's just, it wouldn't work that way. So if the asylum officer makes the, a positive assessment, which becomes locally known as a positivo, uh, then, <laughs> then, um, then she goes and lives with family or friends or something somewhere in the United States who's her sponsor. And she has a year to file, prepare and file her asylum case to, um, to make that case. And then, and then it actually gets reviewed fully with all the appropriate evidence and, and that kind of thing. No. Uh, that is at the discretion of each immigration officer, the asylum officer, if they want to um, accept questions, suggested questions, and um, they may limit the amount of time that we are suggesting things. And it could be that they say, nope, that's too leading, or they may say, um, I understand where you're going with that, and then follow up with the suggestions. I would like to say I was very pleased with the asylum officers who conducted the interviews that I attended. Um, I attended five credible fear interviews during my five days here. I thought each of the officers that um, handled my interviews were very thorough, very professional, very courteous. I didn't feel that they were bullying my clients and I, I thought they were really trying the best they could to elicit the testimony um, without coaching them, of course, that might ultimately be needed to have a positive uh, credible fear determination. My understanding was that it, it varied by the asylum officer. And usually, my experience this week is that they allow, they say, counselor, do you have anything at the end? Or, or they, they tell the woman, now I'm going to uh, allow your counselor to ask you questions or say anything he wants. So that has been my experience, but with that interview, two and a half hours I was ready for maybe 45 minutes of asking her my own questions. And this is her reasonable fear interview, which has a very higher standard, so her risk is high. And he turns to me and says, Counselor, do you have anything? And I say, yes, I'm ready to ask questions. And he says, you have one minute. They, they are asking, the, the asylum officer is asking questions directly to um, the woman. And as a volunteer, we are just sitting there. And we are allowed to take our own notes, but we're not an active participant. Um, it, it is between the asylum officer and the woman. And there is an interpreter uh, over the phone 
that they utilize. And then um, the immigration, the asylum officer then will, um, once they're finished with their questions, um, it can take days before a decision is made. When women get positive decisions, it means that they're released from the detention center and they get to go to their sponsor, which could be a family member in, in the United States somewhere, maybe it's Houston, maybe it's Maryland, Ohio, and they go to that person uh, and they at least have a chance to live here outside of a detention center uh, for a bit until they see uh, a judge, an immigration judge. Well, if the, if the asylum officer gives them a positive result, then that means that um, the pro bono project is going to advise the women, you're going to be released here. It, it could be a, a number of days, but they will get released. Um, advising them that this was temporary representation, um, so they're going to have to get an attorney where they go and follow up because this is just the beginning of a very long process. The hardest part about this week is thinking about the stakes for if the women get a negative decision after their interviews because we sit with these women for sometimes five, six hours prepping them and we hear and ask about all the details of their life back home. and. That includes issues of poverty, extreme domestic violence, um, gang violence, uh, violence from the government against them, terrorism against their lives, it, and abuse of their children, and death threats of their children, and how their neighbors have been killed and murdered and by the, from the same types of death threats, and uh, how you know, children from uh, the local elementary school have been taken and murdered or kidnapped and uh, trafficked and they've received the same threats and they're very credible to them and that's why they made the journey, the long journey here uh, with their children and they risked their lives on the journey. So the stakes for getting a negative are mind-blowing. These women are at the hands of the United States government um, and are either given an opportunity to um, try to pursue and live a prosperous life here in the United States or go back to their home country um, and be killed. And we've, we've seen multiple times this week I have sat with women, I've played and colored with children, and then have learned that they were deported in the middle of the night. And then they have their interview, they usually get their results within four to seven days. Well, if they, do, if they uh, do not pass the credible fear interview, if they get what we call a negative credible fear finding, they are immediately deported. If the person is granted asylum, they now have authorization to work and live in the United States. Once they have had asylum for a year, they may then apply for lawful permanent residence, which in common parlance is called the green card. Uh, because there are so many people with so much need. And uh, one of the reasons there's so much need is because now, especially from attorneys, is because the procedural postures have gotten very complex. Most experts will tell you that immigration law is the second most complex practice, area of practice uh, that an American attorney can practice in, only taxation uh, being more complex. Nobody knows it all, nobody can do it all, so we always are, are working together collaboratively on our cases. The and pro bono project um, has a huge impact uh, because the thing is the law is, uh, is very complex. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily something that any person, non-native speaker or native speaker, could just roll off the top of their tongues. So um, do I think that legal advice makes a difference in terms of one's ability to put forward a successful case? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And the so attorney knows which facts need to be stated on the record to prove the case. 
Um, these are very fact-specific inquiries, and someone who comes in has no clue what is going to be relevant and what is not going to be relevant. But when lawyers began representing people down here at Dilly, um, the number of positive, the percentage of, of uh, findings that were positive went way up um, once people had access to counsel, um, which is why we think it's so critical to do this. I guess the most compelling thing is the unmet need for legal services for uh, people in extreme situations who have no other resources available to them. The evidentiary burdens are considerable and the factual inquiry uh, that the asylum officer makes does call for a lot of very specific information that needs to be provided. For me, the most satisfying part is when you get to really spend a lot of time with a client and you really are able to feel that you made a difference in preparing her for her interview. I mean, I think that there are some people because of they have been through so much trauma um, that they just really have a hard time telling what happened to them. And so sometimes, you know, when you meet with someone at first, you kind of get a little bit of a brick wall, but then as you start to develop a rapport with them and ask more questions, you end up finding out pieces of their story that um, you never would have heard otherwise and that they probably would not have told the asylum officer about if you hadn't sort of gotten it out of them and then explained to them why it's so critical to their case. Because they obviously don't know asylum law, so they don't know why it's necessarily important to share a detail about, you know, something that would matter to their asylum claims. So. Um, a volunteer was talking about an interview that she had with a client, um, and she asked her that, she asked her, so what do you think of the facility? How are you and your child liking the facility? And the mother's response was, my son loves it here. He can eat as many apples as he wants. So even if the conditions of this, of this jail, which is, is, it is what it is, it's a jail, um, even if these conditions in the jail are less than ideal, it's better than what the mothers were dealing with in their home country. It looks somewhat like a jail in that it has, uh, you know, barbed wire fencing around it. So the um, the way that the grounds are laid out is it's all a, a series of large trailers, um, and that's basically what the complex is. So you go into the security trailer. That's the first trailer, and that's where you would, you know, take up your empty out your whole bag, and you can't bring in any electronic devices, and that you go through security, and they wand you and everything. And then from there, we go into the legal visitation trailer, and that's where um, the, basically the only place that we go, because that's where we're meeting with clients. Then the women and their children are housed in different trailers, and there's also a trailer where the asylum interviews take place. And everybody can sort of walk with escorts in between all the different trailers. We have not actually seen what the living quarters look like where the women are, so I can't really speak to that. One of the joys of being here uh, that I did not expect was that these women and children, many of them say that it's heaven, heaven here, uh, because they're safe and they aren't, they're no longer walking in the middle of Mexico uh, trying to get to America. They're, they're no longer in danger of being kidnapped by gangs on their journey here or by things happen to, happening to their children and they're getting fed and they're, the children get to play. They can walk around with, while being detained, of course. We, we believe that they're in jail right now. But to them, to them, it's, it's been a joy to see them be able to breathe. Most of them have had the reaction of just being like overwhelmed with gratitude and so happy that someone is working on their case with them and makes them feel a little bit like they're not alone in, in this struggle and they you know, have someone, someone that they can turn to for advice and counsel and that kind of thing. So it's been really, um, really meaningful. Quiet. But it's an, you have to be inherently mobile. Last night in talking with my friend, we were talking about what pictures we would have taken if we could have, because we're not allowed uh, cell phones in the facility. Uh, and she said one of the pictures she would have taken was of everybody walking around with their laptops on their arm or on their, on, uh, you know, on their hip, 
because you're you're essentially mobile in the room either to talk to a client or even to just get a, uh, even just to get a, a appropriate to get your computer f on a table where you can type in notes about the client. The, the, vis the legal visitation trailer is where the Dilly Pro Bono Project is, and there are guards from the facility at the entrances to it, but other than that, basically this space is ours. There's a big uh, common room in the middle where the women can sit and wait and can also have the, the charlas that I was talking about. And then all along both sides, there are um, interview rooms, private interview rooms where the door can shut so that people can talk about their cases in confidence. The, the sheer need of the moment means that there's actual skills development going on. Uh, you, you get much better uh, in doing that. And I, I That's the best part of this week, is meeting, getting to know these amazing women you know it obviously makes you just feel so grateful for the lucky hand that you've been dealt in life and the fact that your children are growing up in a safe and healthy and happy environment um and you know so i think that is and, and just you know beyond just your children but just in general i think yes it does make us a lot of us feel very grateful um and it makes a lot of us feel very angry that you know our government is doing this to people so I'm not sure what's going to stick with me 20 years from now about this week, except that well uh, 10 or 20 years from now, maybe the little kid who was sitting in my room having been separated from his mom for two months will be in my classroom. Uh, trying to learn how to practice law. I met a little girl, very, very bright. I mean, just as, just as smart as can be. And after talking with her and preparing her and her mom for their interview, I told her, you should go be a lawyer. I hope she will. So another thing I'm gonna take with me is the sense of injustice the feeling that so many things are not right in our country. Well, I think the number one thing that we all walk away with is that family, which we may, may have already had going in, but is that family detention is wrong and it's not the solution to our immigration crisis. And Obama did it and Trump, Trump wants to ramp it up even more and it's wrong and we shouldn't be doing it. How, how a parent's love for a child or what a parent's love for a child can drive them to do and as the son of uh, of an of, of immigrant parents and as an immigrant myself um, that's something that I can take back with me it makes, I will always remember these women and the, the ways in which I felt like I was being effective and I want to be able to do that uh, and I think a lot of attorneys would get a lot of joy with helping with these kind of cases. We, you know, we're tired after working all day and we're really emotionally drained, but we also spend a lot of time talking each night, kind of debriefing, and then just trying to like, you know, have a beer together and, and, and spend some time together. Because once you've been through this experience, I think, you know, only the other people who've been through it can really understand. So there, it does have that feeling of kind of um, cementing friendships and, solidarity because we're all engaging in a shared experience um, in taking in and absorbing the years of pain that these women and children face I guess what I leave with more than anything is a desire to encourage others to to take the plunge and, and do what I did and spend a week down there helping they need all the help they can get these people need all the help they can get Obviously, for an immigration attorney, it's going to be a little bit easier and a, a, not as much of a learning curve as someone who uh, has not done immigration law. But I think that definitely that we have had several, we had a couple lawyers on our team that had never done immigration law before, and they did fantastic. I just fell in love with the immigration practice. And there is a beautiful camaraderie among immigration attorneys. You can I think a lot of what we as volunteers get to take back our the stories of these women, right? Um, and the stories of 
we sort of get to play the role of myth buster in a way because the, the stories of, you know, the way that these women and children are being painted are, are that of someone who's coming to this country to take advantage of the system and, um, and be lazy. Um, and what these, wom what these women are doing are reaching a breaking point that won't allow them to stay in, the, at, in their homes. Um, we, we worked uh, very, very hard in our undergraduate lives and in law school and passing bar examinations and everything else to become licensed and accredited attorneys. Um, most of us live very good lives, which, which we should be grateful for, and we should pay that forward, um, imparting some of our, our knowledge and expertise to the, to the causes of, of those who are uh, the most helpless and the most voiceless. Um, so if there's one type of personality trait that makes its way over here, it's that of the self-aware person that realizes truly how good they have it and are able to use that and bring it here and share, that, share their skills and their talents with these women and children. This was an inspiring week. It was inspiring to be around people who, um, out, of good, out of the goodness of their own heart, they decided to come here. Nobody lives an hour or two or three away. I mean, everybody made the time and the expense to come down here and help. And that was incredible. Um, you know, representation is a, is a word that gets thrown around in the legal field. And, uh, and it really, this is a situation in which it becomes, in, in which representation becomes tangible. Because these women don't have anything here. Right? Um, they have no idea about the process that they're about to embark on um, in, terms of, um, in terms of navigating the immigration process, which ultimately is, um, is a legal process, right? And so these women having nothing, this is where these lawyers really step up. It's very um, inspiring because you have a group full of people who don't know each other, who come together and work collaboratively on the moment, um, out of sheer, out, out, of, out of the sheer, the compelling need presented by the clients. Uh, it's kind of amazing how, how we can use our pro bono hours to help people who are in incredibly difficult, difficult situations, um, and we can, it wouldn't take a lot of time on our end to help them. So that, this kind of experience solidifies that fact in, in me is that each year, each month, uh, while I'm an attorney, for the rest of my life, I can be thinking, there's always in the back of my head, there are people in this country and in the world who are in life-threatening situations that I can just volunteer a few hours to, and I might be able to change their whole life. Um.